Hello guys, this is Project England Rising and today I'm here with James Desborough who is a leftist, or oh, sorry, a left-wing anarchist. Um, as you all know, I've been wanting to get a leftist on for a while and I first came across James, some of you might have seen his videos, the first time I came across him was a video he did on white genocide where he rejected the premise that white genocide is happening. I think he, the video was posted on the right stuff uh, or something like that. And I commented on that video like in a pretty white nationalistic way and then James like replied back in an articulate, really civil like fashion which surprised me a bit. So that like, that struck me about him. So later on, I went back just to see what his politics were going like. And I saw that he was a leftist who like believed in like freedom of speech and stuff like that, which like made him stand out from others. So that, that kind of got me interested in him. And I subscribed to him and started watching his stuff. um so yeah if you've got any questions he's willing to answer any questions you've got so just ask him in the chat and i'll put him to him but james thank you for coming on man by the way because there's not many really many leftists who do this probably well i'm not sure because i'm I, i've not really had one on before but uh, can I'm There'd be a few, I expect. A lot of them would just, just want to argue with you. I'm sure we'll have things we disagree on, but you know, I think if we don't talk, it just makes things worse. So, yeah. yeah. Well, can you, if you would, can you just tell people what you identify as politically and also how you got into politics, if you don't mind? No, that's fine. Um, okay, my viewpoints are kind of shifting around at the moment, but I'll stick with what I have been. Uh, for the longest time. I'd identify myself as a, as a left anarchist, uh, ideologically. Pragmatically, I'm more of a socialist. And over and above any other beliefs that I happen to have, pragmatism ten tends to trump them. Um, so, yeah, I don't think anarchism is possible yet, but it's the ideal I would like to see in the future. For the time being, I see socialism as offering the greatest opportunity to the greatest number of people um, and the greatest freedom to the greatest number of people. So that's that's why I look at that. Or there's there's some other reasons, some practical and scientific reasons. Um, I guess I've all, always been interested in politics for as long as you know, as, as long as a child could be interested in politics. I remember yeah. at, at primary school making the anti Thatcher posters and getting in trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. In our club, yeah, that was primary school. Um, my, my dad was quite a big influence. He was always shouting at the TV when politicians were doing something stupid. So, yeah, th there was that. Um, so I've, I've always been interested, and I'm, I'm sure you'll touch on later. I'm, I'm a game designer, so from a sort of yeah, world world building and history perspective. You know that that always tweaked my my interest there as well. So, yeah, I was always interested in history as well. Um, and at, at college, I studied history and and politics. Um, and I've just yeah you know, stayed stayed interested ever since. Really, I mean, it's how how things work uh, or don't is is always always interesting. So, like, there's a lot to talk about in them years like when you've been through your political years, but like as the world stands now with everything that is happening, what are your thoughts on like the train wreck basically from all angles of what is happening at the moment in the world in general? God, it's so, everything is, it's just one of those periods where everything is in flux and everything you thought you, you knew and uh, you know, was kind of set and settled is, is all moving again. Um, but things that at the same time are so fundamentally different to any previous point in history that it's just, it's, it's really interesting. It's terrifying <laughs> a lot of it at the same time, but it's really interesting because you, you can't really underestimate 
sorry, you can't really overestimate, no, underestimate. Oh, you can't underestimate how much impact the internet has had on yeah. politics. I mean, you look at the Arab Spring, you um, you look at the way elections are being fought now, you know, Donald Trump's camp are really winning it on the memes and things. But, yeah. you know, Hillary's paying out millions and millions of dollars to people to operate online for her. You know, you've got the Chinese government and the Russian government paying people to troll forums and leave comments and stuff. You know, this is all known stuff. Yeah. And you've got, you know, WikiLeaks just recently dropped all that stuff about the yeah. Democratic yeah. Congress in the States as well. You know, that's changed everything. And it's also brought people together across international borders. So, you know, you're as likely to fall in love with a girl from Estonia as you are from the girl down the road these days, you know? <laughs> so yeah, it's had such a profound political, social and economic impact that the kind of things that are happening now, happening in that context is unprecedented. So I, well, I don't know. It's interesting times. Well, like just looking at things as we are now, do you think that we are going to but things are going to end up being okay. Uh, and 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 also, what would be the ideal uh, direction for society to go, in your view? Those, those are big questions. Um, yeah, 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 quite big questions. I think, I think, barring all-out thermonuclear war, I think the human race will will survive, carry on, thrive. In one way or another, we're a, we're a bloody tenacious species, most you know, because of our access to technology and and knowledge. So you know, one way or another, I think, barring absolute disaster, we'll we'll do okay. The way I would like to see things moving, um, I would like to see things moving in a kind of Star Trek utopian kind of way. You know, bring the world together, see ourselves as as human first before anything else. Yeah, see that we have more in common work together, combine our resources, you know, because if, if we can get off this rock and, and just out into the solar system, you know, we'll become hugely wealthy as a species. And, you know, the, the sky's the limit at that point. But you've got to set aside your tribal differences and get get off this rock to achieve our full potential. And that seems a long way off at the moment. Well, that what you've just said, that, like, I love that. Like, I'm really into sci-fi and stuff like that. And I've thought about it in that kind of way. But, and this is just like touching on the race question, which we'll utterly disagree on. <laughs> Do you think, I mean, this is my view, we could have that future, that Star Trek future and everything like that. But because we whites are going to be a minority in his own nations, it like pretty soon, none of that is going to happen because there's going to be no whites to realize it. Okay, yeah, this is where we disagree. I don't think race is that fundamentally important when it comes to these issues. Um, right. And yeah, we're going to we're going to violently disagree on that. But if, yeah. I, if I can just briefly explain why, I, why I think that. Um, the reason I think that is because I think it's the culture that we produced. Um, that is more important. It's it's the scientific method. It, it's the knowledge we've accrued. It's the ability to apply technology and i think we were lucky i don't i don't think it's inherent in our, our nature as a race because the differences between the races are so really very minor very edge kind of things that it's it, culture is far more important i mean you look at what the chinese are accomplishing now in terms of space travel and so on they're probably gonna there's a good chance to get to mars before elon musk or, or anyone else you know and you look at places where but if you think about it, you know, kind of, we exported our culture. Um, places like India, you know, they're they're up and coming fast. So I think it's more to do with when, once you deal with poverty, once you deal with malnutrition, once you sell people on the idea that these these cultural values and so on are are valuable and rewarding, then I think you lift everyone up, and that benefits benefits us all. Okay, but like you've just you picked an example there with the Chinese who um, they are intelligent and they are doing good things and they are also a very they are still a homogenous nation which probably has something to do with that do you think China is odd I probably should have choose, chosen a better example in India is probably a better example because it is really lots of different cultures kind of banded together and the same is true of China but they've had like 10,000 years to kind of beat everyone into into a homogenous flat lump really um, China 
has basically been the same for about 10,000 years. It's just every now and again, they kind of rearrange the furniture and, you know, kick out the emperor and put the put the party chairman in instead. So there's, there's a continuity and a stability to China that's, that's rare everywhere else. Now, you can see that as a bonus, but... I mean, the reason they took such a beating in the um, 1800s and 1900s is because they were so isolationist. You know, they weren't exposed to new technologies and, and ideas. And so they got steamrolled by other cultures like like Japan, yeah. um, who, you know, embraced Western technology and, and applied it um, to horrific effect. So, yeah, maybe, maybe China wasn't the best best case. But I do think. Oh, OK, OK, well, but. Do you honestly? I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and say this in the most unoffensive way I can. Do you, do you honestly think that us whites are the same as blacks and Muslims? Like uh, in in every well, Muslims not a race for a start. So do, do you mean Arabs? Uh, well, I kind of see Islam as a brown pan nationalist entity as, as well as a religion. But I, yeah, I, I suppose Arabs. Yeah. It's really kind of a kind of a sidetrack, but um, I I have to object whenever anyone says says Islam's a race. Um, right. it's, really, it's it's a combination of religion and ideology. I mean, I'm an atheist, so I'm no no no, sympathy, am, yeah. for, no yeah. sympathy for Islam at all. I just would object to it being called a race. Um, okay, so do I think we're the same? I mean, well, there like, are obvious... like sorry for interrupting you. Like for instance, no, if you if you look at Af uh, Africa. They're still living in huts and and things like that, and I'm I'm not saying it's a, I'm not putting them down for this. Like my main problem is the fact they are in our nations and and raping as women and children and things like that. Uh, but if you look at the nations, we're still building huts. Whereas you look at our race, we've gone to space and stuff like that. You could never imagine blacks or Muslims doing something like that, could you? Uh, well, didn't. Didn't Iran launch a Quran into orbit? It was just shows sense of priorities, I think. You know, we we had our dark period like this as well. You know, the the dark ages, and it took the Renaissance, and you know, a bunch of philosophers and mystics and so on being burnt at the stake and whatever, for us to get free of that. So, I have some some sympathy um, for the problems in the Muslim world that are brought about by religion, which I feel is holding them back. Um, but to go back to the original question, I mean, there's obvious superficial differences. Um, yeah. between the between the races you know different amounts of melanin in the skin different eye configurations hair types and so on you know northern europeans tend to have lactose tolerance you know and there's there's possible genetic historical reasons for that but by and large the differences are, are very minor um so yeah and you can find brilliant people and stupid people in in every in every race i think the problems in africa <sighs> It's kind. Of, uh, I could just try to think how to explain this. To to me, I look at Africa, and as a hoary old leftist, I I see the class wealth divide, but written yeah. in a kind of national and international level. Yeah. So you know, if I, if I look at the poor and destitute here or in America or in America, you know, I see people who have no way to better themselves. Yeah, or at least it's very very difficult, even with the best will in the world, even for the hardest worker. You know, society and so on is is very much set against you, and a lot of people fail. You know, um, America's even worse for us for for people getting themselves up out of poverty, and yet that's the American dream. So then, to bring that onto the sort of national and international stage, you look at these third world countries, and yeah, you know, I, I I wouldn't completely dismiss other factors, but I would say you know they have been exploited historically. They've ended up stuck with bad leaders. Um, and some of that's to do with the Cold War. Some of that's just because that's what happens sometimes. Um, international debt is a, is a big problem. It stops them being able to grow. But then there's a few success stories. South Africa, not doing quite so well lately, but it has done quite well. Nigeria's reasonably wealthy, doing all, doing all right. Um, uh, and hopefully we'll see, we'll see more of that in the future. Just regarding South Africa, I think, I'm not sure of the stats, but I think there's essentially a genocide against whites going on in south africa uh, uh, now uh, you saw my video about the white genocide so there is something going on in south africa and it's ugly and it's racially based i don't know whether i would still call it genocide it's that uh, other country mugabe zimbabwe there i think you might have a case oh, oh, oh. for 
yeah. for white genocide. South Africa, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I could be convinced, but I'm not convinced yet. I don't think it's organised. I don't think it has state sanction in the way that Zimbabwe does. So you obviously reject that white genocide is is taking place. Uh, we disagree on definitions. Is, is basically the thing, unless people are being yeah. dealt with in a systematic, organised, you know, governmentally sanctioned manner. I would be very reluctant to call it genocide. What do you think of this? I mean, the like blacks and Muslims, they are essentially ancient racial enemies throughout history. We've always fought. We've always fought each other. Do you think it was a good idea to let these people who they, they are they clearly are like haters or they think that we owe them everything did you do you think it was a good idea to let these people into our nations okay i don't agree that we owe people anything i mean i i i don't believe in original sin and i don't think crimes can be transferred whatever my ancestors may or may not have done I didn't do anything, so why are you holding me responsible for it? Yeah. Um, as as regards coming into this country, um, I mean, Indian immigrants have come in and they've become very productive members of the community here. They've assimilated well. You know, the the Sikhs and so on got tons of respect for the Sikhs, um, and the Gurkhas that have come over more recently. Uh, a lot of them settled near me in places like Reading, and you know, they're very very industrious, very. They've incorporated into the community. I think the West Indian community, um, at least the original sort of generations that came in, did did the same. Um, but I don't know so much about Africa. I used to spend a lot of time in London in a lot of the poorer neighbourhoods, so I would hang out with people and would get to know them. I didn't really have any problems with them. And the same with the uh, people from Islamic nations that had moved here as well. I mean, a lot of them you know, we're, we're getting plastered on a Friday night with the rest of us and, you know, yeah. stopping up for a kebab or a bacon sandwich first thing in the morning, or whatever, and didn't take their religion or anything that seriously. So it, like, it's, well, it's, it's hard. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, just let, just let me finish up quickly. It, it's, I don't know what is going on at the moment with, with the radicalization because yeah, I think the sort of the people who came here first and maybe the the kids that they had seem to become part of British society. But now it's the the grandkids and the new immigrants don't seem to have the same attitude of wanting to be part of the culture. There's a lot of self segregation going on, which I don't think helps. Um I don't think it's all down to Middle Eastern policy, but I don't think that helps. I do think Islam as a religion is is a problem. Um, but I think that the best way to deal with that is kind of similar to how the Soviet Union was dealt with, just to show people that you have a better quality of life here, and you know our our our, our way of doing things is in many ways better. Do you, well, do you not think it's because multiracialism and multiculturalism is just is just a total and like complete failure, and that there's a reason why our forefathers never let non-whites in over thousands of years we've been a nation uh, and it's just a, and it's just a complete failure is that the reason uh whites are divided up into various races you know britain's been invaded and taken over by Angles, saxons normans vikings celts Picts. you know our history is actually pretty pretty mongrel <laughs> you know? yeah yes but they were you, they're white. all white but yeah. I would say, you know, that's still a still a racial distinction, and we used to all hate each other, even if we, even if we were white, you know. So there's it's the same stuff there. Um, What's what what interests like me and like my mate, my white nationalist mates on here on YouTube and that is like like you're obviously intelligent. Does it ever? Do you ever think about what is going to happen when we are a minority in our own nations? Does I it? Say, See, I, th this is where our fundamental difference is, I think. I, it's, I see culture and knowledge and that as being of primary importance. Um, race means nothing to me. That's why I ha also have exceptions to people like Black Lives Matter or Nation of Islam. You know, These people who put race at the forefront, but they're talking about 
you know, non-white races. Um, because to me, it's 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 just not important compared compared to culture. You know, if there's an Indian guy who's you know grown up in Croydon or whatever, went to Oxford University, yeah, he's as he's as English as anybody else, really, and very much likely likely to be. Okay, maybe he's got a six armed statue in his house, but what what difference does that make at the end of the day? He's taken on our values, he's become part of our society, and he's then perpetuating that that culture into the future so for me it's it's the memes not the genes so so you disagree i mean i'll say that culture and race are totally connected and intertwined um and i would, would disagree so what well, i strongly disagree yeah yeah um save to the extent that you know human beings have a common genetic history and there's influences from that on all of our cultures i think so they tend to be hierarchical um and they tend to be cooperative in one way or another you mm. know but that's that's us as a as a species rather than race which is a distinction i don't see as particularly meaningful unless you're getting a organ transplant or worrying about sickle cell anemia you know yeah. the, the, outside of those edge cases it just doesn't seem to have that much of an effect well what do you feel like when i mean just as animals as creatures we instinctively want to protect as women and children when you hear of all the rape cases and and things like that does that does that twinge anything uh, or like prick any kind of instinctive like protective urging you or i mean like as i see it we, we other leftists have have spoken to we seem to have created like a barrier from these things what just block them out i don't think a lot of these people who call themselves leftists are leftists you know as someone who's studied history and and politics has had a lifelong interest in it i view left-wing values as being essentially that people should be treated the same equality before the law and so on so i look at things like the the, the rape gangs and so on that we've had here and yeah. yeah i i'm i'm fucking enraged and i'm especially enraged that the reason they didn't go that, that they didn't get caught for so long was because people were afraid of being called racist you know so so about so it does it does anger you then Oh, that, absolutely, and it's and it's a it's a it's a cultural thing. Partly, partly the religion, partly the places these people came from, and then that's compounded by the fact that people are too afraid to treat them the same way we would a we would a, a white gang, a white Christian gang doing the same thing, you know. Um, and so they get away with it. Um, you know, we can't we can't let this stupid sensitivity get in the way of justice because equality before the law doesn't only mean rights and freedoms it also means punishments and and sanctions you know so yeah. they should be treated exactly the same as we would anybody else but that's not what happened so that's that's the aspect that worries me in that we are no we've abandoned this idea of treating people the same and we're now granting special exceptions and we're worried about our image rather than seeking justice that that's the aspect that worries me as to bringing people in um it does worry me, but it worries me because of the culture more than the race. You know, I would be as concerned about Muslims from the Balkans who are white, you know, as as I would from from anywhere else, because I think it's more it's more the culture. But then I've known wonderful, good, lovely Muslims. They were not very good Muslims, but they were good good people, you know. So it's possible yeah. for people to assimilate and be productive and, and great, lovely people. Do you not ever think about, I mean, like as, as a white nationalist, I think about stuff like this a lot. Just what we could have been now if we had stayed a 100% a white nation. Just imagine where we would be right now. We'd possibly be colonizing the moon, or I might be exaggerating a bit there. We'd have gleaming cities, we'd be safe, there'd be no terrorism. As NHS, it'd be strong. As welfare state, it'd, it'd be strong um do you know think about that um so again i would disagree that race has much to do with it i mean i look back at when britain was the strongest it ever was so like the victorian era when we were at the height of the height of our empire fifth fifth of the planet under our boot heel um 
and as empires go we were we were pretty nice compared to you know the belgians or the or the germans we we were actually you know not no by no means perfect we killed a lot of people and did a lot of awful shit but compared to the compared to the other options we were primarily a trading a trading power so yeah. we were probably the the least worst option but you know that was all reliant on other, on these other nations it, we were, it was reliant on the wealth of india it was reliant on irish workers coming across the sea you know it was reliant on settling canada uh, australia all, all these other places so you, whereas you know going back to my example of china because that was so insular because it did not expose itself to other cultures and other ideas and so on you know a tiny little island like japan was able to just you know steamroller it when it when it when it came to the came to the time so i think i think we we drew strength historically from our exposure to other cultures and nations and the, and the wealth and power that existed there and i think is, uh, this is something that makes me unpopular in leftist circles, but I don't think our colonialism was entirely bad. There's a lot that was bad about it, but you know, we took the telegraph, we took the railways, we took parliamentary democracy into a lot of these countries, yeah. and you know, th th that was you know, that it wasn't entirely one-sided. Is, is all I'm saying. Um, there was a lot as bad that was bad about it as well, obviously, but we basically built the infrastructure in a lot of these nations. That enabled them to become second world nations, but I think we I think we draw strength most of the time from when we interact with others. I mean, I, so just finish up. Um, you were talking about the NHS and so on. Yeah, yeah we're yeah. we're reliant on foreign workers to fill out the nursing and so on. Um, we have an aging population. If we didn't have immigrants to do these jobs and to produce money, we would be rather impoverished. There's there's other ways around that. You know, encourage people to fuck more, but yeah. But the way things are, you know, we're we're reliant on on that. All right. What do you what do you think about like you see this a lot now, blacks and even Muslims saying that they created science and that we as whites stole science from them. And even that um non whites built Britain and built America. Um okay, some of that's hyperbole. Some of it's nonsense. Some of it comes from racist ideologies, and some of it has a germ of truth to it. So, as regards Africa, there were city states and so on, but they did not get to that higher level of, of civilization, particularly. Um, it's kind of like a bit like South America. They were really good at certain things, not so good at others. Um, I would suggest you read a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, right. which kind of explains why Europe became so dominant, why it developed in the in the way that it did. Um, I can't go into it, go into it here, but to all your listeners or anyone else watching this later, it's a really good good book for explaining these kind these kind of things. Right. Um, now the Islamic nations, they were advanced for their time for a while. Uh, yeah. There's a great presentation by Neil deGrasse Tyson, which should be on YouTube somewhere. Um, where it's, I think it's called Naming Rights, where he's talking about how, you know, the, the Islamic nations created algebra, they named all these stars, you know, they were really good at optics and so on, and then it all went wrong for them. Well, before it went wrong for them, they were quite a multiculturalist nation. They, you know, allowed Jews and others to live amongst them. They were quite cosmopolitan. They weren't quite so... Um, fundamentalist in their religion so it was while they were more open and accepting and and pluralist that they were in their golden age yeah and then it's when the, the clerics I can't remember the name of the particular one but he basically decided that mathematics were of the devil yeah um, and that just brought that all that advancement to an end um, and then that allowed us through the Renaissance to then take on the knowledge from them that we'd recovered during the Crusades and to build on that and to Get ourselves up out of our own religious mire from you know from uh, from the Inquisition and so on, and 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 get out and, you know and technologically advance, and that's where we kind of took off ahead of everybody else. Does it does it um, scare you, if that's the right word, that we eventually will be a Muslim majority nation? Um, I don't know that we will. There's a lot of alarmist statistics around. Um, but 
they're, they're, and they're usually based on the fact that you know they have large families and they and they tend to breed more as if they're going to overrun us like rabbits or something. But the fact is, yeah, after the first couple of generations, once people are settled in, get a bit more wealth and so on, they tend not to breed as much. That's that seems to be why Western nations aren't breeding so much because we're reasonably comfortable. Mm. So yeah, it might happen, but I don't think it will happen as fast as people think. I also think we'll probably see an Islamic reformation before then. So I think we'll see more liberal interpretations of Islam. I think it will slowly become safe to be a secularist or, or an atheist in some of these Islamic nations. Um, so, yeah, like even, I, I don't know if you watch these kinds of videos. I know not a lot of people do because they're so, but like they do, even like I'm desensitized to them because I've watched them quite a lot. But I feel ill after watching them. Do you know the videos of the beheadings? I'm um, recently there was a, a video of a little Syrian kid being beheaded. Um, yeah, yeah. Like wait, like when you see things like that, and you know that they're growing in number. Does it is it like from your like leftist like mindset? Is does it just not not bother you? Like, do you look at it as just wait and see what happens kind of thing? like nothing it, can be done we'll just have to see wait and see it bothers me immensely um because i'm concerned with the rights of everybody and all rights stem from the right to life you know and i look at the terrible things islam does and the terrible beliefs that, that are in it and yeah that, that worries me a lot i don't think that i don't think that just bombing people is, is going to work. I, I, I tend to look, like I said earlier, it's kind of Cold War example. We need to demonstrate that our our culture is is better in some ways, you know. Um, and I think we do that by being more human, not less. I do think we should intervene sometimes. Um, I do think we should fight sometimes, but I've been unconvinced by the recent conflicts because they seem to have just been making things worse. Yeah, um, Syria. I was on board with for a little while, but it's just turned into such a mess. I don't know how anything's gonna gonna change with that. Iraq was pointless. Afghanistan had a point, but I think we've botched it horribly. Um, and I I just can't see the I can't see the the worth of of staying embroiled in these things. We just seem to be making things worse there um, and not providing any real solutions. I don't know what the answer is. is Does it? There. Like, but does it not show you that that this? I'm I'm not even I'm not even just talking about non-whites here. Um, I'm talking about the whites in power. Does it not show you that things are seriously like wrong or degraded? The fact that our governments went and helped the Islamists in these nations. Do you know like that's how incompetent they are? Um, uh, geopolitics is complicated. You never really know how things are going to go, but. It, I mean, this kind of business as usual, really, people fucking up to that degree. So I guess I'm cynical enough that it doesn't surprise me. Um, well, at, at this at, point, at, at this, this point, point no longer surprise. I mean, most of this is, in my opinion, more to do with resources and containing China than it is to do with what they say it is to do with. So just like from that angle, even if it is like a, about resources and stuff like that do you not think uh the world is in a bad position now do you not think that as a race it to be a good idea to draw all his resources in and just use them on his own people i i can see the argument for that but that's also the argument that tends to lead to stagnations of cultures i mean um when you look to like i've given the historical example of china again and again but it, it's, it stays true. When they were isolationist, they became weaker. Um, America, when it was isolationist, was weaker. It was it was intervening in World War One and World War Two that really turned it into an industrial and financial powerhouse. So I don't think isolation is the key. I think I would rather see us build up impoverished areas and help solve their problems and turn them into allies. Um, kind of the way we did with with Eastern Europe, um, rather than withdraw and just you know leave them to to rot. Um, I don't think that's I don't think it's a very charitable 
way to look at it. I don't, and I don't think it's a very pragmatic way to go about it. I, I you, think it's it's better off to build everyone up. Well, like when you look at non-white nations and just non-whites in generally, do you um, feel sympathy for them? Do you feel an urge to help them? And do you think that we as a race have an obligation to help them? I don't. I don't see it. I, I still. I just don't see it as a as a racial thing. You know, uh, if I pass a homeless person in the street, I don't check what what race they are. I judge whether they're genuinely homeless or whether they're just going to spend it on booze or drugs or whatever, and then maybe drop a drop a couple of quid in his cup. You know, and yeah. you know, scale scale it up to to a national level. Um, you know, if if we metaphorically speaking, you know, give them a, give them a shave and a suit and a job interview, that's that's a better way to go about things, I think. But then you're going to have some people who, who can't be helped. Um, and it's hard to know what to do in those circumstances. It's just, it's, it's really like, I've, we talk about it a lot, like me and other white nationalists on here, just like, just for leftist mindset, we just, we like, we find it hard to, get in the mindset of your mind and other leftists mind like just not to feel this like we'll like just with a general situation what's happening like we feel this primal like rage i mean like the latest islamic attack seeing dead white children uh and that happening daily and all and, and white kids in poverty and all the on all the other things it's like a, a, a really primal rage what we feel but you leftists just don't like you don't well I, well you've said that you do feel that but yeah you, but generally um, you tend not to i can only, i can only speak for myself um in that when i'm trying to fix problems i try to be dispassionate about it i try to be objective yeah i try to step back and think okay how would we actually solve this situation uh, rather than just getting angry. I mean, the, the anger is what you will usually propel me into thinking we need to fix this. When it comes to these kind of attacks and things, it's um, it happens so much that I just kind of feel this kind of heavy sadness because it's all so fucking predictable. You you know yeah. how things are going to go. The, you know, the moment you hear there's been an attack, oh, they're going to deny it's anything to do with Islam. It's going to come yeah. out that he is something to do with Islam. Then people are going to make all kinds of apologies for it. Then maybe there'll be a hashtag. Maybe people will change their profile pictures on Facebook or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. A few people will say some nice things and then it'll all reset ready for the next one. And it's just, yeah, my primary feeling at this point is more despair than anger because nobody seems seems willing to address it and as as a leftist who sees problems with islam and so on i look at people like sam harris uh, yeah. you know, bill maher people like that who do speak up and i see how they get treated and it yeah. does make a lot of us afraid to speak up because we get accused yeah. of being like you <laughs> so yeah 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 um well, but we're coming we're coming at it from a from a cultural and religious perspective rather than a race one that's that's the difference but then we get yeah. accused of being racist anyway so uh, well, well that is something what i was going to ask you because you are like pretty unique as a leftist in being for well in fact are you for absolute freedom of speech i am personally are you for absolute freedom of speech i i'm a pretty much a, a free speech fundamentalist but i try to understand the other person's point of view uh so i would say yeah all the way apart from maybe direct appeals to violence and as that lost you a lot of friends a lot of leftist friends yeah <laughs> it, it has um yeah it's it's had a quite a negative impact on, on my career um i have dedicated uh, trolls and harassers who follow me everywhere and give me shit about everything I do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's def definitely, definitely a thing. But, but, it, but it's like that, isn't it? It's like free speech, the simple act of saying what you think and, say, and saying reality and what you see. That is it's such a basic human 
um, desire and right, isn't it? And nothing can be done if people cannot say and think what they want. And I, and I personally, and I said this in my videos, I, I think, as I see it, free speech and free thought is illegal in England and Europe uh, now. Yeah, the a aspects of it. Um, see, this is this is why I agreed to talk with you. You know, our, our, our viewpoints are wildly, wildly different. Um, we don't agree on very much, but I think we should be able to talk and argue and, and disagree yeah. and be reasonably civil about it rather than screaming and throwing trash bins around or setting off fire alarms or whatever. Because I think if we have this conversation, we can see that we share concerns. We disagree maybe on how to deal with them. But we can see that the person on the other side is human and has reasons for thinking as they do. Um, and maybe we can slightly change each other's mind a little bit. You know, that's, that's, that's productive in a way that shutting down conversations isn't. Yeah. Right. Um, to everyone in chat, if you've got any questions for James, uh, just type them now uh, and ask them. And just while you're doing that, James, can I just ask your thoughts on the Donald, Donald Trump? Donald Trump. Um, okay. I think he's terrible. I also think Hillary's <laughs> terrible. Um, and I'm unsure whether an incompetent evil that can't get anything done is better or worse than a competent evil that can get things done. Um, I applaud the way that he has wound people up. Um, I applaud the way his campaign has managed to use the internet and made fun of people and opened up a lot of conversations and made a lot of people make fools of themselves. But I would not want him to be the man with his hand on the button. So what do you feel is um, authoritarian and... I see everyone says he's Hitler. I'm not convinced that he's Hitler. I think he will just say whatever it takes to get him elected. I think he's an egotistical moron. I think he's a populist windsock. He'll just say anything, do anything to to be the the best, the big man or whatever. So does he yeah, not I, I find it hard to find him threat threatening, put it that way. But do you not think it's like with the threats what we face? Do you not like from uh, ISIS and all the others? Do you not think that we need strength or some kind of st like strength, and we need to be aggressive as a as a civilization, and and we need those types of leaders? The uh, thing is, quietly, you know, um, you know, Obama's bombed the heck out of a lot of people, drone strikes and so on. You know, there's been all kinds of operations and stuff going on. It's not like, you know, the previous administration's full of doves or anything. So all Trump really brings to the table is, is bombastic rhetoric. Um, and history tells me that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, I mean, I, I look at the aftermath of Brexit here, um, what that's done to our discourse, to the experiences of people living here. Um, and I would worry about the same thing, making race relations and so on in, in the States worse, even even worse than Black Lives Matter making them. Do, do you think that um, physical race wars are inevitable, by the way? I mean, I personally uh, would say that the race war against whites has already begun psychologically, physically, demographically, financially, everything. But do you think physical race wars are going to come as non-whites become 50, 60% of a population? I don't think it's inevitable. I think it's very likely in the States, but the States has a very a weird and unique situation in all this, uh, in terms of politicization, in terms of arms, in terms of its wealth gap and lack of social investment and so on. So there's a degree of desperation and anger and violence that's just kind of inherent to the American national experience, I think, that makes it more likely there. You know, we've had a couple of riots and looting incidents. That seems to happen every so often, but it's nothing like what they have in the States. So... Uh, but I would blame all sides for, for that in the states. I don't. I don't think it's inevitable at all. I think. 
I, I, just, I would just go back to what I said earlier. I think it's about it's about the memes, not the genes. It's about the culture. Uh, someone's uh, asking: Is IQ important? Uh, not like between the races. Would you would you put a lot of importance on that? Okay, uh, there's actually a lot to say on this. Um, I'll try and keep it as short as possible. The old IQ tests were not very good, and they were differentiated by race because the questions were slightly cultural. So that led to some older studies which suggested that intelligence was inherently linked to race. Right. The newer IQ tests are more accurate, but they still show a slight disparity. Um, as you guys probably know, you know, people of oriental extraction yeah. tend to have higher IQs than we do. Yeah. And and so so it goes on down through. But there are problems separating out that data from other factors. Um, and this is always always a problem with this kind of statistical data, because yeah, if if you if you did it within this country, within our communities, for example, you'd find a lot of coloured people taking the tests would be recent immigrants. Maybe they were malnourished in their childhood. A lot of them would be poor. That can lead to malnourishment. That can lead to malnourishment in white communities as well. Yeah, and that has a major negative effect on IQ. If you, if you don't get proper nutrition when you're young, you have you're much less likely to be. As, as smart as you could be when you get older so yeah you, know, you so, you'd have so, to you'd have to compensate for all these problems now i'm not against studying this because i i want to know uh, yeah. personally i don't believe that a proper study would show a differential by race if you once you compensated for all these issues but i'd want to know but it's such a political hot potato that nobody is really willing to do the studies properly. So, so, so you, so you really would not agree that there is like biological differences in IQ between races. E'd, like even just by looking at the civilizations. I mean, like the other day, I typed, if you type in black culture on YouTube, it shows you one example is this black dude, and he's basically blowing into this cow's ass. Um, and it, it's it, it's but they've up uploaded it as an example of black culture. But there's other things as well. Just looking at uh, civilizations, does that alone, and also the crime statistics, does that not alone tell you that there is racial, big racial differences? But we've we've done stupid things in the past and believed stupid things as well. I mean, people used to believe disease was caused by smells and things, for example. So you know, there's, if you go back, there's plenty of examples of of white cultures believing nonsense and doing stupid shit <laughs> you know that's that's not unique it's just well and and look how long it took for technology to really take off you know we were we were basically the same kind of agrarian hitting each other with club society and until the renaissance you know um and a lot of these areas haven't had the same kind of input don't have the same kind of education and so on that, that we've had if, if we give everyone more equal opportunities maybe we'll see a flowering of these other cultures what was the second half of the question um well i think i got into aggression the crime oh uh crime statistics are you, are you talking about within um within different racial communities in in our country or the states um I mean, well in our white nations really well really america and england mainly but oh, everywhere, re really. Okay, yeah. So I've gotten into arguments with a few Black Lives Matter types about this because yeah. they keep insisting that you know the the cops are particularly out to get black people. Um, but then you you point at the differential in statistics, like uh, the black community in the states is much more likely to be poor and much more likely to be involved in crime. Now you would you would put that down to some kind of racial differential, right? Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Okay. Whereas whereas I would put it down to wealth and class issues because they tend to be poorer poor communities tend to be more criminal you know poor communities tend and more criminal communities tend to run into the police more um then there's cultural issues as well um in in the states um so these these are factors that i think are much more important than race i mean once you control for wealth and class a huge chunk of the difference in arrest rates and so on it just dis disappears poor whites are in pretty much equally as bad a position as, as as poor blacks in the states but they don't get the same kind of publicity and so on i see it as an issue of, of wealth and class not of race so do you, so so you believe in equality uh yeah Provo well equality of opportunity not equality of outcome i believe everyone should have the same 
rights and as equal an opportunity as, as we can provide them so that everyone has the chance at least to achieve their potential. So equality, yeah. not homogeneity. Uh, but do you also believe it in the way that all all races are equal? Uh, and what I'm getting at is like when they say, because blacks are not doing as well in some places or they're committing more crime, they blame it on, because we're all equal, it must be white racism because we're all equal. And that, and that is like a, causing a lot of problems. So do you believe it in that way as well? Um, I don't believe in blaming it on that um, because I think that's treating people equally and social investment, basically, giving people opportunities, other other ways to go about things. I think that's the, the potential salvation of these communities. So I don't believe it's the problem. I, I believe equality is the solution. All right, everyone. So, well, just to like start wrapping things up um because i think i've been talking for about an hour now i'm not sure yeah, how about, about that i think um what how do you think how do you see the world in 50 years and how how do you want it to be in 50 years 50 years so that would be 2066 um you know a month or two ago i could have given you pretty detailed ideas of how i think things are going to go and how i'd want them to go now i'm just unsure of everything um i think we'll continue to see larger blocks of nations coming together despite everything that's happened between us and europe i think that project will continue i think north america will tie closer together i think russia will consolidate its power with its you know, former former states. I think China will continue to consolidate, though that bubble's going to burst at some point. I think the Pacific nations are, are going to come together. So I think we're going to see these larger kind of economic and political blocks emerge, which is both good and bad, um, because if you trade with someone, you're less likely to have fights with them. Mm. Um, I think the big battle over the next decade and into that period is going to be about free speech, free communication, um, because we now live in an era where the, the public square is now owned by private companies and they're controlling what you can say. So yeah. censorship, our primary concern when it comes to censorship isn't so much the government anymore, it's private companies like Facebook and Google and so on. I think that's going to continue. Um, I think we'll get into kind of an arms race between people trying to communicate and people trying to stifle communication. Do you um, think that, like, because like you're a games designer, aren't you? I think you said. Yeah. Can you? I mean, this is maybe not that much political, but do you see a time coming where I mean, like, virtual reality is just finally starting to become advanced enough to be usable and good? Do you see a time in the next few decades where people essentially are just living on the internet? And like basically on some kind of drip and and literally living their lives on the internet. Um and that's it. And just like Google just like overseeing it all, kind of like that kind of utopian kind Ra of rather than retreating into virtual reality, I think what we'll see is information space becoming integrated with the outside world. I mean, um this is gonna sound really stupid, but but hear me out. Think about Pokemon Go. Yeah. yeah. Now, everyone, everyone is playing it, and it uses augmented reality. It uses GPS. It, you know, it overlays the Pokemon on the real world. That's the kind of thing we're going to see, except it'll be kind of like geotagged Google. So you, know, you look at a building, and information about its history and so on will, will come up, or people will be able to overlay fantasy worlds on the, on the world around them, that sort of thing. So I, think, I don't think we'll retreat into our bubbles. I think we'll take the games and you know the internet and all that out into the world so uh, yeah, the next 50 years they look pretty pretty grim to me but not yeah not the end of the world when you said that interest when you just said then that lately you're not sure about things is that because you are seeing cracks in just the multiculturalism multiracialism and you're seeing the like horrific possibilities what is coming is it anything to do with that um like because be, like, you said lately you're not sure is it because of what's happening like with the uh, 
daily Islamic attack, which is basically daily now. And I, it's more the, the kind of fault lines I see opening up on the larger scale. So, you know, it's not the bombings or whatever. It's more the way our politics is shifting, the way our culture is shifting. The, the censorship really concerns me. The potential yeah. scarcity of resources in the near future, that, that, that worries me a great deal. Um, there's a lot of talk at the moment um, about what they're calling post-factual politics. I've not um, heard it. I've not heard about it. But... Well, the, you look at someone like, like Trump or you look at the Brexit vote and, you know, a lot of the political campaigns lately on all sides really have been characterized by lies and bullshit. And it, you know, it takes effort to work out who's telling the truth about anything. Yeah. And lots of people don't make the effort. And to a lot of people, the truth doesn't seem to matter. You know, it, it's the it's the rhetoric. It's just this person say the right thing, feel right, you know. And what? democracy democracy relies on an informed populace, and I don't think we have that anymore. And it's everybody's fault. What, so what, that, that worries me. What, what do you think about this? Like you're big on free speech and what's happening on the internet with freedom of speech and things like that. But what do, what do you think of this? Because we are a multiracial nation, increasingly. Because multiracialism essentially means chaos, the powers are having to grab more and more powers in order to keep the whole mess together. And because of that, that is why we're losing speech, because we can't risk anyone saying something that is going to make non-whites kick off. Is that a connection what you uh, make or agree with or just totally reject? Uh, in my experience, it's much more than the, the minority communities. It's it's the guilt-ridden <laughs> middle-class white kids who kick off, you know? Um, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know. And I don't think multiculturalism has to mean chaos either. Um, and I think there's there's a... We can have a common set of cultural values that would allow people to live alongside each other without problems. Um, and most of the problems we're having at the moment come from Islam because it's a very, very evangelical religion that seeks to push itself onto others. Yeah, we need it. It needs a reformation. It needs to be softened and blunted in the same way that we have done. Yeah, but, to Judaism yeah, but, and Christianity. Yeah, but but James, the thing is, like, but what you essentially are saying is that should be met with love and tolerance, whereas I would say something like Islam. Which, as like as I said, I see it as a brown pan racial entity. But even without that, it is an aggressive foreign ideology. Okay. Well, I, 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 I don't think it should be met with love and tolerance. I think we should take the piss out of it. I think we should right. jail people who use it as an excuse for things. I think we should pursue, uh, you know, gentle mutilation cases and, and so on with the same kind of energy and and anger and as much punishment as we would if anyone else did it right. um if multicultural means they have to accept our culture as well yeah yeah um and our culture okay let, let me put it like this Con controversial for me to say it but i consider western liberal small small l liberal culture to be better yeah. than middle eastern Is islamic culture yeah. So, yeah, I think, and in amongst those those values that our culture has that I think make it superior, are things like tolerance. But that doesn't mean we should let ourselves be ridden roughshod over. We have to insist that they also be tolerant. Yeah. Yeah. But do you not do you not think that every single bit of weakness we've showed, it just emboldens them? Uh it's see it's this is really difficult to to find see, a handle on see, um, see, see like as i like as a uh, working class english lad i whether it's online or otherwise i see these muslims uh, and blacks and the hatred they have for us and they think that we owe them to think this nation's theirs the top they boast about raping as women and things like that. It is literally to, to me and other white nationalists uh, here on YouTube. They are literally a foreign army, and we just feel like rage 
towards yeah, it's, it's, again uh, it's not by it's by no means all of them um a lot of the the cultural attitudes are more widespread than maybe we'd like but that kind of that kind of group the ones talking about you know raping your women or whatever some of those are bound to be trolls quite frankly um and the others are just going to be a, a horrible, nasty minority, just as it is in any but, in any other group. But but it's but it's not just non-whites. I mean, what do you think of the, of these whites who are so self-hating? They literally just want everything to be destroyed. Uh, do, have you got any theories as to how it's happened? Such like vicious self-hatred. <sighs> the guilt is a is a big part of it. Um, yeah, you know, I, I came through education before that kind of interpretation came through, though, yeah, the, the whole guilt guilt thing. Um, though there was some of that. I, I like to think the education I had was reasonably balanced. You know, we looked at the good and the bad, but now it seems to be much more ideological. You know, we can do nothing right. We, we you yeah. know, we, there was no good side to anything that we did, and to even suggest that there was is, is anathema. Yeah, um, and I don't think that's right. I don't think any. So you are proud of some of his heritage, as a race. Uh, you know, where I was born and what colour I am is is purely an accident of geography. But you know, I look at democracy. Um, I look at the concept of human rights. Uh, I look at accomplishments like the European Union. Um, now it's going to make me unpopular with some of you guys, but yeah, <laughs> you're probably you yeah. know. Um, but I, you know, I look at all these all these things we've managed, and but I, I see it as cultural. So, and I didn't do any of that. So it's kind of it, proud isn't the isn't the right term. Um, these so, things are good, and I want to see them continue. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's kind of my attachment to it. This appears to be the best way we currently have of doing things. Well, like, I'd like to keep doing it. But well, on that on democracy, I. Uh, and I say this all the time, we, we no longer live in a democracy um, as far as I see. Not yeah. really. Um, yeah, I, I would agree. Both the US and the UK were pretty much run by rich, moneyed interests at this point. Both of our electoral systems are screwed. We need some kind of root and branch reform, get money out of politics. We need to get rid of the first-past-the-post system over here. We, we need proportional representation so that people's actual views are reflected in Parliament. We need to get rid of the Lords um, if we want to reclaim any any kind of real idea of democracy. What we have now is barely a democracy, but barely a democracy is better than the alternative. Uh, there's a comment here. I don't know if you'll find this offensive or if you have, have any response to it. Uh, <laughs> Tay AI says, I admire your patience, England. This guy is a total cook, like cook. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I assure him I'm not a cuck. Quite the opposite. Yeah, I'd uh, I'd say that. I mean, there's people like Kevin Logan, uh, who I I can't like I per, I can't actually stand watching him because of it. So, do you see us in the same bracket as people like that and others like him? Uh, like I said, I don't think they're left in the same sense that I am. Um, I, a lot of their viewpoints I don't see as leftist because they're trying to set themselves up as a moral authority. They do not see people as equal. They want to set up special conditions and special dispensations for people. They want to abrogate basic human rights like freedom of speech. So to me, they're not really adhering to any leftist philosophy that I've studied. Yeah, um, but, yeah, yeah, but not ever really. So to me, the, I mean, the only things me and them might agree on is some of the goals and that we want people to be equal. But I think the way they're going about it virtually guarantees people won't be equal and maybe we'll agree on some economic issues. Um, but on the things that really, really matter to me, like, like free expression, um, we're at absolute loggerheads. Do you get into a lot of arguments uh, with people like that? Yeah, more than I do uh, your lot, honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I don't tend to run into you guys so much. I tend to I tend to run into these these people more. Yeah, uh, or, yeah, and they come after me actually. So what? What and do we get? Is it is it is it quite vicious? Like just because you're 
gone oh, up. Oh, it's, it's incredibly vicious. Um, you just have to, that, this is the thing, you just have to disagree on one point with them and you're the devil. Yeah. Um, and they won't listen to you explain your point of view or why you've had it. They won't even try to change your point of view if they're presenting something that you reject. It's just educate yourself, shit lord. You know, they won't make the effort to try and educate you. I mean, I said I'm, I'm an atheist. I get into arguments with creationists. When we get into arguments about evolution, I see it as my job to try and educate them, you know, on why I believe as I do, what the evidence is, and so on. But, you know, if I run into a particularly rabid radical feminist or or whatever, and we get into an argument over something like, I don't know, objectification or free expression, or whatever, they're not willing to make the effort to argue the points that they're making. Yeah. Um, and as someone who is an activist in, a, in other areas, that just seems bizarre to me. Education is the job of an activist, you know, to let people know why you believe as you do and to try and convince them through evidence to agree with you in some way. But they don't they don't do that. It's just fuck you and then they block you or, or whatever. And that seems counterproductive to me. What, what are your thoughts on feminism? Do, is that a big is that something what you think about a lot? Do you see it as a big particularly? Well, one of the main problems of the like degradation of society. Do you see it as a main problem? I think it was a good thing for a very long time. I think we basically have equality in every meaningful sense in Western society now. Yeah. Um, maybe to the point that the pendulum has swung the other way. I see the kind of things that they keep arguing for and arguing about as being pointless or counterproductive. Um, I don't like the censorship. Or, you know, I've got friends who work in adult entertainment or sex workers and so on and yeah. you'd think feminists would be all about supporting them yeah and helping them and it it's not it's absolutely not they seem to be rabidly against them you know they want to censor pornography which puts you know people i know out of work but that's thing isn't it but like it used to be the conservatives who did that and it's just now totally it's totally don't know 180 into yeah, it well now... but this last bit of censorship that, that we had in this country was to do with uh video streaming pornography and so on it's basically yeah put, that was put, that... yeah yeah it's yeah. Put a bunch of people i know basically out of business to try and take the government to court but that was an alliance between the conservatives and some radical feminists including gail dines you know, you'd never think these kind of people would be in bed together metaphorically speaking but they they were and they pushed through the censorship agenda and it's hurt women so, you know, what, what, yeah, what are you doing? And it's like that. When they uh, ate on, I mean, like, I don't read the Sun or any, like, newspapers, really, not, like, uh, material papers. But when they were getting on at page three, things like that, and models as well, these women, they're actually, it's actually a really empowering position for women to be in. And, and they say it themselves, it, they feel empowered. Yeah, there's a... There's a few people who leave the business un under a cloud and have nasty things to say about it. But by and large, you know, it's, it's choice. You know, um, if you can do what you love, if you can make money doing something that you want to do, great. Why is anyone trying to stop anyone doing that? Who does it, who does it hurt? And if you think it genuinely does hurt anybody, prove it. And then maybe I'll change, change my position. But, yeah, it's just... It, 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 so little of it seems to be based on any science or an actual desire to help women. It seems to be more based on a desire to control people. Do you think that, I mean, as a white nationalist, I'm not, I'm not a men's right activist. And I, I'm not, I don't like the MGTOW a lot. But um, as I see it, we've lost control of us women. And that's partly why things are out of control. Because women are beautiful. They're different to us. We're feeling in, in uh, each of us weaknesses and strengths but when we're in political power it is a disaster so as men we need to be as white men we need to be, be men again and like rein them in not dominate them but like well gently dominate them but just not like bring the natural balance of the male female dynamic back what are your thoughts okay. on that <laughs> okay i would disagree with a lot of that uh the, the domination thing sounds okay but only with consent <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> um oh god where do i even start with that no i don't think we need to control anybody i i want people to be free because i'm an anarchist right yeah. so women should be free to do what they want 
but what they want should be allowed to include being a traditional housewife or whatever if that's what they want to do you know yeah. leave leave everyone as free as possible to live the kind of life that they want to lead so long as it doesn't hurt anybody it's nobody else's business so you know if if you want to get into that kind of relationship with a woman who wants to get into that kind of relationship more power to you i'm not going to get in your way go and have fun if someone else wants to fuck a different guy every night or whatever i don't care either it's not hurting me have fun love do what you want and the same goes goes for it goes for anybody else as long as nobody's getting hurt i don't see a reason to to interfere so so you basically want there to be no driving force to society i mean like i'd want to white nationalist entity not an old-fashioned one a modern one what embraces technology like i'd want to see full work automation and so work was not something that was desirable nor needed that's um, very likely to happen but uh, but i'd want a strong white nationalist entity all non-whites would be deported <laughs> like that's just uh, and all resources would, would go to his own people and that'd be that'd be the driving force, but you like want it to be totally rudderless type thing, don't you? Mm, no, uh, we agree on wanting science and technology to keep moving forward. Um, and I see science and technology as a way of bringing the whole human race up and learning more and exploring more, making people's lives better. That would be the that would be the driving force for me. Um, the, you brought up the automation thing. I mean, it's it's almost certain that work is going to become a thing of the past yeah. within the next century, and we need to find a way to tackle that because the kind of economic and political structures we have at the moment are not going to survive that that kind of paradigm shift. You know, um, so that that's going to be going to be interesting. Obviously, I would disagree with you on the on the um, you know deport all the foreigners and <laughs> yeah uh, you know everything else, but um, you know, a, a technological advanced nation striving to become more technological, to know more, to become bigger, and to bring it everybody up. That would that. But I would extend that globally. I want to. I want to bring the world up. I want to bring humanity to a higher level. That that might be the key difference. I mean, like as a white nationalist. I mean, like as a lad. I'm a I'm a decent lad. I'm not. I mean, I'm not a nasty person. I don't like that. But when I look at Africa, I feel virtually no sympathy for it. it it's going to sound. It, this is going to sound really bad, but I don't feel much sympathy for them. I just feel sympathy for the poor white working class uh, kids who've been failed. So yeah. I. So, but you look. But you have a global outlook. You want to spread it out. Yeah. Um... But some of that is enlightened self-interest, meaning that we would benefit from building up these other nations. You know, if you build powerful trading partners, then both sides profit. You know, this sounds weird coming from a left-wing <laughs> socialist talking about the market and, and money and so on, but it works even even without capitalism. You know, if, even if you have stronger stronger partners, you both you both gain, you both benefit. You've got more people, right? So say we invested a lot of money in education in an African nation. Yeah. yeah. So that that country would then have a, a new set of really educated graduates. Maybe they could start to deal with the problems in their own nation. Maybe they could start to make new discoveries and so on that would benefit the world as a whole and would in return benefit us. Plus, they you know, if they build up the economy there, they've got less reason to uh, to emigrate here, maybe put less strain on our resources and so on that way. But you know, I don't think it's one or the other. I think we can invest in our own working class who have been left to rot yeah. since Thatcher, really. You know, yeah, we can we can do that and we can help other people. You know, you can do you can help people in Africa much more cheaply, basically, than you yeah. can people here because their problems are so big at this at this time that any help makes makes a big difference. Um, and that would that would feed back to us. But yeah, um, the plight of, of young white boys on council estates does very much concern me. Yeah, and and just regarding like you talk about Thatcher, like as a northern lad, I I can like I have some kind of alignment with when it comes to stuff like that because even though I'm like radical white nationalist, I I'm not economically, I'm not right wing or conservative, 
so I'm pro welfare. I'm not. I'm anti austerity and things like that. Uh, yeah. So I've never liked the Conservatives. Uh, but yeah, regarding council estate, white kids, poor kids, that is like a focus of mine. Yeah, that is. I mean, yeah. that, to, just to see the destruction because I connect that with the direct cost, which is hundreds of billions of. Um, five decades of multiracialism and immigration. The the total cost of it, I I die, and even the austerity, what we all what we're under now, I connect that to decades of multiracialism and immigration. Okay, this is the big thing that that really worries me. Um, in that the the crappy way that we approach these problems is what creates kids like you. I, I don't want to be be rude, but that's no 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 sorry. That, that, that that's what that's what concerns me. Um, because because poor poor people poor working class basically have so little, um, the fighting over what's left becomes really vicious. And to me, this kind of racial consciousness, this nativist versus immigrant consciousness, gets in the way of class consciousness. I would rather see poor blacks, poor whites, poor immigrants working together to put pressure on government and to demand more resources and more assistance. That would be should be given to them on the basis of need, regardless of where they're from, you know. Yeah, so. but but honestly, looking at the situation, I mean, uh, I'm assuming that you've got a few, like you're in a few private social media groups with leftists and so on. Like you've seen the views of non-whites. Like surely you see that that is never going to happen. Any kind of. Um, like coming together. I mean, like I personally do not want it. To, I, I want us to stay separate. I don't want assimilation. I don't want us. I don't. It, it's impossible for us to live with a races. Uh, I think. I, but, I, I disagree, and that's both from personal experience um, and just just looking at things on a societal basis. And and I really, it really does upset me. It really does upset and worry me that. You're all at each other's throats instead of uniting against the common enemy, you know, which is this this austerity, um, this demonization of the poor mm. that, that that goes on. You know, I've got I've got disabled friends and people, you know, who have lost friends to suicide and so on because of the tr troubles with ATOS and yep. all the rest of it. You know, the, these things affect the poor whoever the poor happen to be yeah and like you things know. like things like that they like really discuss and the bedroom tax which is that, yeah. That, that's, yeah but i and other white nationalists i connect i always connect that with what multi uh, multiculturalism has done to us i mean just just think of a total cost of us of this entire multiracial project of accommodating this unnatural system that cost that, uh, that is why we're in this situation. So I always put blame on not not just on the non on the non whites themselves, but on the traitorous politicians, kind of thing. Yeah, I would put the blame on the politicians, and I would put the blame on classism. Um, and I really wish <laughs> I, I know it's a it's a vain hope, but I really wish you guys would work together ac across racial lines um, on on these issues. Um, and I, I would see that as a way of building friendships and solidarity and, and getting more more of a voice, more of a say um, and addressing some of these some of these issues. But uh, yeah, that's that's a faint, vain hope. Um, and it's yeah, I argue this to the other side as well, uh, but they're completely mired in their own racial politics. You know, all they want to hear about is that racial minorities are oppressed they don't want to hear about the the race and class issues or the the problems that people have in common they just want to put it all down to racism so yeah i, I get stuck in the middle on this one all right man um well wrap it up at that then if you if unless there's anything else what I've you got, want I've got one, to... one question for you oh yeah if you yeah if you've got any questions um so you're, you're pretty anti-immigration yeah yeah what about Romanians and Poles who are white? Um, I if if they are quote unquote racist, then I like them. If if they are anti-immigration, <laughs> anti-multiculturalism, I I I like them. I like and that's 
the white nationalist thing. But I also think that separate white ethnicities deserve to be preserved type thing. So uh, ethnic English, which I'm guessing you would deny it, exists uh, ethnic english people uh, um, there was um, actually there was a really interesting article in the news earlier apparently britain still divided up into its old saxon tribes basically um uh, so yeah basically we 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 stick to our own <laughs> even within our whiteness apparently which i i thought was really interesting but, yeah but when it when it comes to i mean like we we were polish i mean the other day poland um destroyed its racial hate speech laws but uh, uh, racial discrimination thing they banned that and they took it away so that were that shows me that the polish are racially aware so that makes me like them on the other hand i know that the, it causes problems kind of thing but on the whole i don't have much problems but then again the most likely all voted to stay in the EU, so it's like it's a it's a little bit nuanced on that. Yeah, yeah. but I, it, just, I just I just find it funny that you're okay with immigrants so long as they're racist. <laughs> just, yeah, that just tickles me. <laughs> yeah, if uh, if a uh, nationalist, if uh, anti anti Islam and stuff like that, then I'm okay. If it, and if a pro multiculturalism, then I'd say that that we should be deported, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Okay, that was that was all I had. Um, all right, um, but yeah, I just want to say thank you for coming on because, like, you're the first. Like I said, I've wanted to have a leftist on for quite a while, and you're the first one who's come on. So thank you for coming on. No, oh, I'd like a, like a like I said, I think talking's important, even if we disagree. Um, and obviously, we disagree on a hell of a lot of stuff, but there are a few things we seem to, seem to agree on. And hopefully, I've given you some stuff to think about, and yeah, you've given me some stuff to think about. So, yeah, it's all good. Uh, and hopefully, uh, sometime we can do it again, uh, maybe. Yeah, sure. And um, get some you, more questions from your from your mates and stuff. And um, yeah, do you just want to tell people if you well, if you want to, where they can find you? Um, I doubt you'll want to find me, but uh, I'm Grimachu on Twitter. Um, my website for my games company is postmortemstudios.wordpress.com and you can find the other ways to get in touch with me on there if you if you want to. Um, I'm generally happy to talk about this stuff with anybody provided they're reasonably polite. So, yeah. All right. Hey, nice one, man. Um, all right. Well, well, we'll wrap it up there then. So, everyone listening, as always, thank you for listening. Uh, I'm for taking part in the chat and i will speak to you all soon so i'll see you later guys and i'll see you later james mate and thank you no problem <laughs>